thank you very much. I want to start with the land and the water. The Tamaki Isthmus, the Waitakere Ranges, the Manako and Waitamata harbours. The mountains and the harbours that were formed millions of years ago by the uplifting and downfaulting of the crust in this region. And I want to start with the people. I give greetings to the mana whenua of this place, Natafatua. I give greetings to our host, Napui, and give greetings to I give greetings to Nahapu Katua or Tamaki Makoto. I acknowledge Te Tiriti or Waitangi as the foundation of our nation. It's fantastic, it's fantastic to see so many new faces and old faces of our green movement. I greet you all. And I know that, like me, you are looking forward to election year because election year is an opportunity to put our vision in front of the nation. And our mana, and our reo, and our iwi o te mutu. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Summertime is about the simple stuff, land, water, and people. It's about swimming in the ice-cold headwaters of a river. It's about walking in a forest and walking in a be on a beach. It's about spending time with the people that we love. Now that might seem a long way from the topic of today's speech about the economy, but it is not. The true test of an economy is not the rise or fall of GDP. The true test of an economy is the well-being of our land, our water and our people. It's that simple. The Green Party vision includes a way forward for New Zealand's economy. The neoliberal economic experiment has suffered a catastrophic collapse. We have witnessed market failure on a colossal global scale. Lack of regulation has cost taxpayers trillions of dollars around the world. We have been forced to relearn the lessons of the 1930s. Markets, particularly finance markets, need regulating. Not that New Zealanders really needed to be told. Uh, we had the collapse of the finance companies and we also had the leaky homes disaster. The National Party's decision to deregulate the building industry in the early, early 1990s has cost our country dearly, more than $20 billion to repair leaky homes. That's four to five times the cost of the Canterbury earthquake. The leaky homes fiasco and the global financial crisis were both due to lack of regulation driven by the neoliberal economic project. The old order is dying, but what will replace it? Now there are some in the government that wish to go back to think big economics. Think big economics with its centrally planned drive for growth regardless of social or environmental costs. Now we see reflections of Think Big in, Nas in the National Party's motorway, motorway projects and in the giant irrigation and hydro schemes being planned for Canterbury and elsewhere in New Zealand, facilitated by the destruction of democracy in Canterbury. But Think Big was an economic failure. It was an ecological catastrophe and it was a democratic travesty. Stephen Joyce may look to Rob Muldoon for his inspiration, but the Green Party does not. <laughs> the next economic wave won't be Robert Muldoon with an iPad. The next economic wave will be smart green economics. Smart Green Economics takes the best from Keynesian economics and the best where it exists from free market economics and places it within the framework of a planet with finite resources. Smart Green Economics can retool our economy for the planet we live on today. Smart Green Economics is the economics of a world that needs to nurture its people and its environment. It is an economics that says we need to live within our means, that we need to treasure our social capital and our environmental capital, not just our financial capital. It is the economics that says we must stop borrowing from our grandchildren. 
Smart Green Economics is unashamedly based on a love for Aotearoa, our land, our water and our people. Now two years ago I gave the State of the Planet address just after an election and I spoke to you about a Green New Deal for New Zealand, a plan to address the economic crisis and the environmental crisis, a Green New Deal to create jobs and protect the environment. Now I challenged John Key at the time to take up this plan and to be fair, fairness being one of the things the Green Party values, <laughs> to, to be fair he picked up one component, our warm healthy home scheme. And I'm proud to tell you that by the end of last year, over 80,000 New Zealand homes had been insulated as part of that scheme. <laughs> over half of these 80,000 homes were occupied by people on low incomes. I am proud that the Green Party led this change and worked alongside government to make it happen. Over four years we will make 180,000 homes warm and dry. Families will use less energy, keeping warm in winter, and they'll save money on their power bills. Parents and children will say health, stay healthier and miss fewer days of work and school due to sickness. And I'm proud to say that at a time of record unemployment, we will create over 2,000 jobs. Now this scheme is not cheap but it is an investment in our common future. An investment that will repay us many times over in savings in health, energy and education. This is smart green economics in action and it is a great achievement for the Green Party. Now the Warm Home Scheme is just one example where the Greens are leading change and it's change that's good for all New Zealanders. We are able to do this because of the MMP voting system. MMP has delivered great ideas like Kiwi Bank, paid parental leave and the Greens Warm Home Scheme. MMP is a fair electoral system and it means that every vote counts, unlike other, vo other systems where a lot of votes are wasted. MMP means that women, young people, Māori, Pacifica and Asian New Zealanders are represented in our parliament and MMP has delivered stable government. We trust that New Zealanders will vote to keep MMP in the referendum next year. But beyond programs that started with the Green Party, this government is bereft of economic vision and it's making a mess of budget management. Instead of smart green economics like a CBD rail loop for Aucklanders, we see faith-based transport infrastructure blowouts <laughs> We see $10 billion spent on new motorway projects that don't even have an economic case. This $10 billion tragedy locks us into one outdated transport option with high greenhouse emissions and leaves us exposed to high oil prices. It is poor quality spending at a time when money is tight. The government's cash deficit this year is $15.6 billion. Government debt is, pro is projected to hit $84 billion by 2014 and servicing that debt will cost us billions of dollars a year which will add to our chronic current account deficit. Now the Greens support borrowing for infrastructure that will benefit future generations like a decent train system for Auckland. But under national it is all pain and no gain. We are borrowing money we can ill afford to spend on projects that are ill considered. On the revenue side of the government's books, National's tax cuts will add $15 billion to government debt by 2015. And for what? A person on the median income received a tax cut of $14 a week. The head of Westpac received a tax cut of $5,000 per week. Borrowing for tax cuts that are targeted at the wealthiest is reckless and immoral. National's leaders, <clears throat> National's leaders then have the gall to tell us 
that the fiscal deficit that they created is the reason we have to cut back on spending on social and environmental programs night, like night classes and community environment grants. John Key is using the debt that his government created to justify the privatisation of public assets. We should be under no illusions. The National Party are heading down a path that will lead to the full privatisation and foreign ownership of key elements of the New Zealand economy. As we've seen in the banking sector, prices will rise, profits will flow overseas, innovation will be stifled by monopoly, and of course the revenue to the government will be cut. Instead of inheriting public assets, the next generation will inherit $84 billion of National Party debt. National needs to stop bludging off our grandchildren. <laughs> the income tax cuts combined with the GST uh, increase are widening the gap between those who have the most and those who need the most. Inequality hurts everyone in New Zealand, rich and poor alike. Inequality lowers your life expectancy regardless of your income. It increases obesity, it fills our hospitals and our prisons, and we all pay those bills. So the smart move is to reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots so that we are all better off. Everyone deserves a fair go. Everyone deserves to get their feet onto the ladder of opportunity. Let me tell you about my family. I am only here today because of the opportunities that were provided to my family. My grandfathers were out of work, heavy drinking carpenters, <laughs> who barely survived the depression with their families intact. My mother never went to high school, and at 13, she went to work in a paper bag factory. My father grabbed the chance to learn a trade, becoming a fitter and turner, and then an engineer. We grew up in a housing commission house in Brisbane, where I shared my room with my three brothers. We all went to the local state school. I was the last of six and the first to go to university. My family had opportunities thanks to good public education, affordable, stable housing, decent wages and conditions, and social security. All of this was part of the struggle of the union movement. Now, my family climbed out of poverty on a ladder paid for by other people's taxes. They, in turn, paid taxes to provide a ladder for someone else. <clears throat> 